In recent centuries, we have turned our attention to the heavens. With powerful telescopes, we have probed deeper and deeper into the cosmos, peering at stars, galaxies, black holes, and planets. We went back in time more than 13 billion years and saw the very radiance of creation. As our understanding of theoretical physics grows, what once seemed radical gradually forces itself into the realm of the possible and even the probable. Multiverse theories proliferate, seeking to answer the deepest questions about what we are and what the whole cosmos is. From parallel worlds of infinite possibilities to barren deserts of eternal nothingness, scientists are dispelling the cosmic fog of the unknown. Welcome to the multiverses. In April 1920, a stage at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., became the setting for a debate that would challenge our understanding of the cosmos. Harlow Shapley and Heber Curtis, two renowned astronomers, faced off in an intellectual battle. While Shapley argued that the Milky Way was our entire universe, Curtis provoked the imagination by suggesting that the universe was much, much bigger. Armed with the largest telescope of the time, the 100-inch Hooker telescope recently installed at Mount Wilson Observatory, Edwin Hubble set his sights on the Andromeda Nebula. What he would find there would challenge Shapley's assumptions and bring about a new era of discovery. In 1917, Heber Curtis noticed a new star in the Andromeda Nebula, and years later, Edwin Hubble discovered cepheid variables in the same nebula. Cepheid variables are a type of star that serves as a crucial tool in astronomy for measuring cosmic distances. The name Cepheid comes from the prototype star Delta Cephe in the constellation of Cepheus. What makes them special is their pulsating characteristic. They expand and contract periodically, which leads to regular and predictable variations in their brightness. After all, how far out in the universe do you think we can see? In 1924, Hubble finalized this question with a letter to Shapley, revealing that Andromeda was not a nebula within our galaxy, but a completely separate and distant galaxy. Imagine that, the letter that destroyed Shapley's universe. Wow! As the 20th century progressed, we not only continued to peer deeper into the universe, but we also began to understand that the observable is only a fragment of a much larger whole. Georges Lemaitre, a Belgian cleric, proposed that the universe had started from a cosmic egg, expanding since the Big Bang. With the discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe in the late 1990s, everything changed. Dark energy, that mysterious something that propels galaxies away from each other, is literally pushing the universe into imminent darkness. But what about beyond our observable horizon? Our universe is just one of a potentially infinite number of universes, each with its own galaxies, stars, and possible life forms. Astronomers like Fred Hoyle and physicists like Steven Weinberg have discovered that small changes in nuclear forces would result in a universe without carbon or that would expand too quickly for stars to form. Almost like winning the cosmic lottery, our universe seemed to have been fine-tuned to allow for the complexity of life. Through this delicate balance, we began to explore the idea of a level two multiverse. Imagine an explosion of universal expansion in the early moments of the universe, a concept known as inflation, proposed by Alan Guth. By a long shot, this inflation turned out to be essential in forming the structure that led to the creation of galaxies. But what if I told you that it wasn't all plain sailing with this theory? In the 1980s, a new understanding of inflation emerged, thanks to minds like Andre Lind and Paul Steinhardt, introducing the inflaton field, which permeated the early universe and drove inflation. Now think of a universe where inflation never stops, where individual universes crystallize eternally. Within this eternal inflation, our level one, infinite multiverse is just one of countless, separated by an endlessly expanding space and time. It's a bit like opening a soft drink and watching the bubbles emerge, each bubble forming a universe with potentially distinct physical laws. But how exactly does a universe emerge from eternal inflation? 
Some suggest it's similar to bubble nucleation, where each bubble defines the properties of the universe it forms. What if I told you that most of these universes would be sterile, lacking the complexity essential for life? However, amidst this endless sea of dead universes, there are small pockets where life is possible. Curiously, this is where we find our universe. Going further, we have other theories about level two multiverses, each adding layers to our understanding of the cosmos. But what if I told you that you were immortal, that you would live forever? What if I could guarantee that no matter what challenges you faced, you would emerge victorious? It may sound like I'm delusional, but welcome to level three of the multiverse, where immortality isn't just a promise, it's a guarantee. Let's start with a simple revelation, the fundamental nature of light. Back in the 1800s, it had been debated for over a century whether light was a wave or a collection of particles. Thomas Young was a genius. He contributed to medicine, music, language, and even helped decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics and the Rosetta Stone. But what really interests us here are his contributions to physics. In 1801, Young set up a simple experiment, a light source and a screen, with another screen containing two narrow slits between them. He reasoned that if light was made up of particles, some would pass through one slit and others through the second, creating two bright points of light on the far screen. But if the light were a wave, that wave would pass through the two slits, radiating towards the screen and creating a complex pattern of lights and darks, an interference pattern. Young set up his experiment in total darkness, directing sunlight through a small hole. When he inspected the screen, there it was, a beautiful interference pattern, indisputable proof that light was a wave. This view lasted for a century until quantum physics came along to mess things up again. Quantum mechanics brought us the idea that the universe, which seemed continuous, was actually quantized, cut up into discrete pieces, and this included light. It was Einstein who first proposed the discrete nature of light, the tiny particles we now know as photons, but that left us with a big problem. If light really is particles, how do we explain the interference pattern observed by Young? To understand this and its far-reaching implications, we need to delve into the language of quantum mechanics. Unlike Galileo and Newton, where an object has a defined position and velocity, in quantum mechanics, an electron is defined by a wave function that encodes all its properties, but it has no unique position or velocity. It is scattered throughout space. In 1926, Erwin Schrödinger derived an equation that allows us to determine how a wave function changes over time. And it is with this equation that we calculate how light, or any quantum particle, flows through Young's slits. Since the wave function is a wave and waves can interfere, we get interference on the screen. Problem solved, right? Well, not exactly. Let's repeat Young's experiment, but this time with modern electronic detectors. With this new precision, it is clear that individual particles are detected on the screen. The particles travel as a wave, creating the interference pattern, but the photons actually interact with the screen as particles, single points, and here the real problems begin. How does this diffuse wave function become a discrete particle? It was Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg who proposed an initial solution, known as the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. For them, the observer is essential in the experiment. It is the observer who demands a result. To understand this, the wave function needs to be interpreted as a probability wave. This idea was first proposed by Max Born in 1926. He said that you should expect to find your photon or electron where the probability amplitude is high, and it will be rarer in places where its probability amplitude is low. But an extra ingredient is needed to transform your wave function into the detection of an individual photon or electron. You need the wave function to collapse. So when you shoot an individual particle through Young's slits, its wave function spreads out, passes through the two slits, spreading out again and interfering with its journey towards the screen. But on the screen, the wave function collapses to a single detection. 
We can't predict exactly where on the screen the particle will be detected, but its location will be dictated by the probabilistic amplitude of the wave function. Many experiments over the last century, with photons, electrons, and other particles, have confirmed this. But there is a problem with the Copenhagen interpretation, and it is this problem that eventually leads us to our unique Level 3 multiverse. Nowhere in the successful mathematics is the mechanism for the collapse of the wave function. The collapse of the wave function needs to be inserted in an improvised way, a piece of mathematical machinery that seems to have no real justification. This is one of the most hotly contested issues in physics, what quantum physicists call the measurement problem. Some have claimed that it is the act of detection that causes the wave function to collapse, with John von Neumann even suggesting that consciousness is necessary for collapse. At this point, the presence of the observer becomes crucial to the outcome of the experiment. Are you curious? The journey through the mysteries of the cosmos continues in the next video. Don't miss it.